Hi, everyone. How's the volume? It's OK? OK, cool. Um, yeah, so I'm Gabby. Um, real quick, the QR code there at the bottom of the slides is going get, to uh, get you to my website, where there's a link to these slides. Also, um, if you want to hit me up on Twitter, it's at Gabdom. Um, feel free to give me any sort of feedback, suggestions that you have. I would love to hear them. And then um, if you want to use any of the content in today's talk, uh, you can do so under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 4.0 license. Um, so I have been um, helping run a monthly coding session in Kansas City for women for the past four or five years. And I started out as a mentor and then moved on to be the mentor director for the program. Um, I've watched a lot of women come in as volunteer mentors to try to help out. I've also watched a lot of women go through our attendee to then they mentor, then they get possibly their first development job. Um, so it's been a super rewarding experience and I've learned a lot about mentoring specifically. Um, so these women, our attendees, our mentors are all badasses. They, you know, they have kids at home, they have full-time jobs. Maybe they're going to a full-time uh, coding boot camp. Maybe they're going to a full-time school type of scenario. Um, they're learning something for the first time a lot of times. And I see a lot of hesitation when it comes to mentoring. Um, so today, my goal is to maybe just demystify a little bit what mentoring is for you guys so that you can possibly approach a mentoring opportunity a little bit more confidently. Um, so let's talk about what is mentoring real quick. Um, you can find mentoring opportunities in different scenarios. One of them might be a one-on-one -on -one relationship. So basically, what you might think of traditionally when you think of a mentorship, a mentor-mentee relationship. Um, you can also find mentoring opportunities in more formal educational environments. So the coding boot camp that I mentioned earlier is a good example of that. Or maybe a more formal classroom environment like a coding boot camp or university type classroom. Um, you can also find mentoring moments in day to day interactions. So um, maybe that's turning to your coworker who sits next to you and sharing some knowledge with them. Or maybe that's um, code reviews. Code reviews are a great spot for mentoring moments. Um, so those are sort of the scenarios in which you might find mentoring opportunities. Um, but ultimately, mentoring is knowledge sharing in any capacity um, with the intent to help the other person grow. What are the requirements to mentor? You need time. First off, you need to have the time available in order to dedicate to somebody that you're mentoring. Um, and you also need to be ready to give more than you take. Um, mentoring is a two-way relationship, and there are benefits to you as a mentor. But really, your mindset needs to be that it's 100% always about the person you're mentoring. And what are some of the reasons why you might want to mentor? You might want to mentor because it helps develop your skills. Um, that could be leadership or communication skills. Um, also, mentoring helps reinforce your knowledge. So there's some truth to the statement that if you can't explain something to a four-year-old, um, you maybe don't have a great grasp of that concept. So finding new ways to explain things to people who are at a different level, who are possibly be beginners in that subject, is a great way to reinforce your own knowledge. Also, you might want to network because it, or you might want to mentor because it helps expand your network. Um, it gives you an opportunity to expose yourself to people who might be outside of your normal peer groups. You also might want to mentor because it helps make a positive impact on your community. Um, you can help create a culture of supportive growth in your communities by being a part of mentorships. And you might want to mentor because it helps nurture diversity and inclusion. So we all know kind of intuitively that diversity and inclusion are important things. Um, but really, they're uh, markers in the tangible success, even financial success, of a company or of a community. So if you're looking around and you see that there are some groups that are underrepresented in your communities, uh, mentoring might be a great way to bring in those people and their varied perspectives that are going to benefit your communities into the fold. You might also be wondering, are you ready to mentor? Um, the number one question that I get about mentoring is some form of, do I need to be an expert? Um, and thankfully, the answer is no. So 
does that mean that you, um, even when I tell people no, you don't need to be an expert, they still want to know, like, doesn't that mean that I need to know the answers to all the questions that somebody who I'm mentoring might possibly ask? And the answer is definitely no, you don't. So no. Um, so uh, many of us have been in the situation where there's somebody who is super knowledgeable. Um, think of a coworker or maybe a college professor, but really when it comes to teaching, they're not helping anybody, right? So knowing something is really not enough when it comes to um, mentoring. Um, also saying I don't know makes you human, makes you relatable, makes you less intimidating, and makes you a more effective mentor. Um, really, mentorship is about two people in a mutual relationship supporting each other through mutual growth and learning. So what does that learning process look like? Uh, one of my mentors uses this in one of her talks, and it's really changed my relationship to the learning process. Um, this is the four stages of competence. So you start out at the bottom where you basically don't know what you don't know. So you're unconsciously incompetent at that point. Um, once you find out all of the wonderful things that you had no idea about, um, you can then become consciously incompetent, uh, which can be a really overwhelming step. Um, and at that point, what you're going to need is you're going to need resources and discipline in order to be able to move on to the stage of conscious competence. That basically means that you can execute on a knowledge set, but doing so takes concerted effort and energy. At that point, you're going to need a lot of time to practice the skill, and you're going to need um, support as well. And after that, if you master the skill, it sort of becomes second nature, and you can move on to the stage of unconscious competence. Um, you've been through this process countless times, whether it was when you were learning to ride a bike when you were four years old, or it's going to be you know, the next front-end framework, or whatever it is that you learn tomorrow, you have gone through this process countless times, and you will go through this process countless times. So um, the only thing that really makes the difference in terms of you being at the bottom of this pyramid or reaching the top of this pyramid is going to be perseverance. If at any point you give up, um, you're not going to make it to the next stage. right? So it, um, this is where a mentor can step in and support you through this process so that you don't give up at any point. And because we've all been through this process so many times, we know intimately what the frustrations are. How many things have you picked up, right, and then given up on, and you really didn't get very far in learning? Um, a lot, I'm sure. So um, that doesn't mean that you need to really feel like you've been through this process in everything in your field in order to effectively mentor. What it does mean is that um, if you've been through it a handful or a half handful of times um, within your field, you are more than well equipped to help somebody through this learning process. I like to add on the idea of reflective competence, too, to this as sort of a fifth stage. Basically, if you don't actively use a skill, um, because things become sort of second nature when you reach the level of unconscious competence, if you don't actively use the skill, you can definitely slide backwards down that pyramid. So reflective competence is a great opportunity for you to start mentoring in order to be able to reinforce that knowledge and continue using it so you don't lose it. Um, quick note on jargon. So jargon is a shortcut to communication. It's not actually communication that's made to further understanding. Um, so if I told you guys that I have spent way too much time on the internet lately looking for the perfect um, A4 dot grid notebook with a click bind comb and a band closure, and that I've been wondering if uh, Stone Paper will let me make it reusable so that I can use uh, my Stadler Lumocolor 311s on them, right? Like, most of you maybe picked up the word notebook, <laughs> hopefully. I mean, definitely where my paper nerd's at, but like, um, if I was to have that super exciting conversation with you about the perfect notebook, I would have to either explain a lot of that terminology or choose to use different words so that you guys could keep up. So when you reach the stage of unconscious competent, competence and things become second nature, um, things like jargon, vocabulary, terminology also become second nature. So make sure that um, your communication is deliberate um, when it comes to mentoring somebody. And keep in mind that jargon is really only helpful when there's already a prior shared understanding.
Um, so what happens when you inve inevitably don't know an answer to something? Uh, this is, it's always okay to take the time to hit pause, to utilize your resources, and to come up with a good answer so you can come back with a clear and valuable response. Um, this doesn't necessarily mean that you don't know the answer. It could mean you don't have enough information, but it could also mean that you're not in the right emotional state to respond in that moment, um, at which point, absolutely hit pause, um, gather yourself, come back with the right information so you have clear and valuable responses. So who should we mentor? Um, you want to mentor somebody maybe who asks for help. Obviously, they're, they're an obvious candidate as far as somebody to mentor, somebody who's actively seeking a mentor. Um, you also want to make sure that you're on the lookout for people with potential. If you see somebody who has sort of um, good intuition when it comes to something, um, you can have a huge impact in developing those skills. It could be somebody um, who's quiet, who's got, you know, like I said, good intuition about a specific thing, or it could be somebody who you just see as a natural leader. Um, these are great people um, to mentor in order to help them develop that potential. Also look for people who are dealing with change. Um, change is stress, whether good or bad. So if you see somebody who's dealing with change, um, how great would it be if somebody came up to you and offered their support right when you needed it? So keep a lookout for, for those people as well. Make sure you're looking for people to mentor both inside and outside of your network. Um, so if you're lucky enough to find somebody outside of your network to expand your network and who maybe has a different perspective than you, um, that's a great opportunity for you, again, to bring those people into the fold, but also to help you identify and overcome your own unconscious biases. So how should we mentor? Uh, we often treat mentoring, teaching, learning as sort of these mystical things that are innate abilities, um, but they're really not. They're skills, and they're skills that need to be practiced, um, and you need time in order to be able to improve and get good at them. So you want to make sure that you're mentoring first and foremost by building trust. Um, so uh, what do we think are some ways to build trust in a mentoring relationship, or maybe even in just any relationship. Does anybody have any ideas? I mean, trust just kind of comes with time. The more you spend time with somebody, the more you just naturally going to trust you. Right, yeah, totally. So trust is something that takes a concerted effort and is going to take time to build, for sure. Mm -hmm. Totally, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh huh. Knowing that you're not perfect, that you are telling on the same level, you have more experience over time, but you're not unreachable, right? Sure. So being vulnerable? Um, totally. So, yeah, what about um, being reliable? So, following through what you say you're going to do, right? Um, what about, um, yeah, totally being vulnerable, being open sharing of yourself, right? We naturally don't trust people who we feel like they have something to hide. Um, so making sure that you're open um, and vulnerable. You want to mentor by helping them prioritize. Um, so ask them, like, what are your goals in this relationship? What are your goals in your career or whatever it is that you're mentoring them on? Um, if they don't know, help them figure that out and help them prioritize those goals so you can help them, um, you can effectively mentor. Also set expectations. Um, make it clear that you expect them to be reliable and follow through, but also um, things like more logistical things, right? Like how to contact you. Um, is, is email the best for you? Do you want them to call you? Is there a time limit on when you want them to call you, right? Is Saturday at 9 p.m. okay or not? Um, do you want to do just remote or do you want to do in-person? Uh, meetings? Do you want to schedule meetings or do you want to kind of ad hoc them? Um, whatever it is that you want to do um, is totally fine. Um, just make sure that you're communicating those clearly so that everybody can utilize the relationship effectively. And network introductions can be huge for somebody you're mentoring. Um, it gives them the opportunity to meet somebody who might uh, in the future become another one of their mentors or even just become part of their support system. 
Um, always, always, always assume infinite intelligence and zero knowledge. You want to treat the person you're mentoring as if given enough time and resources and support, they're capable and going to succeed. And everybody learns at a different pace, right? So make sure you're adjusting your guidance to match their pace, but always assume that they're entirely capable. And when in doubt, just blame the docs. Um, removing roadblocks is something you can do that has a huge impact as a mentor. Um, one, of, one such roadblock is fear. Fear is huge. Um, it's scary to learn something new. It's uh, terrifying for some people to ask for help, right? So you want to make sure that you're creating a safe environment that's going to be a judgment-free zone where they can explore, um, possibly make mistakes, and still feel like they're going to be supported through it. Um, also, establish learning as a value, so maintain a growth mindset and demystify that learning process that we talked about a little bit earlier so they can be comfortable and confident in learning. Um, and you can also assuage fear with uh, fostering collaboration. So make sure that they're a valuable um, part of the problem solving team that you're on with them and reiterate their input as valuable. Um, make sure that you're taking an interest in them, you're sort of learning their hobbies, their interests, you're sharing your own hobbies and interests. Make it a collaborative effort. Um, imposter syndrome is another roadblock that uh, somebody might run into. And imposter syndrome affects people of underrepresented groups more. Uh, when you already feel like you don't belong, it's easy to get overwhelmed by something like imposter syndrome. So um, celebrate their accomplishments. Um, that'll help them keep a positive mindset so that they can squash some of that negative thinking that comes along with imposter syndrome. Um, also reflect on their progress. So it's, if I was to ask everybody in here, what have you learned? How many things have you learned in the past year? I bet most of us have no idea, right? So um, it's actually a great exercise to go home, take 30 minutes, take an hour, sit down, Look through your Slack conversations, look through your calendar invites, look through your Git commits, right? And figure out what have I learned in the past year. And you're going to be really surprised at the number of things that you've learned. Um, so make sure that you're reminding the person you're mentoring where they were a year ago, six months ago, a week ago. Um, I, I also love the idea of a brag book when it comes to this so that you can in real time keep track of what it is that you're learning and accomplishing. And make sure as well that you're encouraging independence. You want them to feel empowered to make the best decisions for themselves. Um, so let them deviate and customize your advice where it's appropriate. Formulating good responses is really important as a mentor. So you want to make sure that your responses are approachable. They're going to be non-judgmental. They're not going to shame anybody in their learning process. You also want to make sure that your responses are vulnerable. Um, so share your own failures and mishaps. Um, make sure that you're, you're bringing yourself down to a human level so that you're not intimidating, right? So if you once thought that it was a great idea to remote desktop into a remote desktop into a remote desktop, and then accidentally took down the wrong server, and then spent the next three hours with the entire staff of a 300-room hotel staring at you, glaring at you as they manually ran credit cards, right? Because you took down the credit card system. like. Share that story. Share where you've messed up before. Um, also, good responses are present. Um, they establish you as available. Um, and really, body language is going to be huge when it comes to these three things. Um, because communication is 65% nonverbal, you want to make sure that what you're communicating is actually what you mean to communicate. right? So don't be checking the time in the middle of mentoring somebody, or multitasking and checking your email, or you know, reaching for the no doorknob, just waiting for that second that you can make your escape, right? Those, these are all things that communicate the opposite of what you want as a mentor. Um, good responses are, always, are also encouraging, which means, um, especially to the first few interactions, you want to make sure that you're being encouraging so that they can start feeling comfortable coming to you for help. Um, they walk the middle path. Basically, they're not too shallow or too deep in their explanations. You're going to give them 
just the right amount of information that they can make a good decision without feeling overwhelmed by how much information you're giving them. Um, so avoid the trap of too much specificity. Um, they're also non-directive. So you can't assume that you know what's best for somebody. Um, but what you can do as a mentor is you can ask them the right questions so that they can walk through their thought process and figure out what it is that's best for themselves. What's best for you or what's best for somebody else absolutely has to be um, self-determined. Let's take a look at some bad responses first. Um, something like, well, actually. Um, this is something that is often going to give somebody a minor correction without being conducive to furthering understanding. Um, right? Like, we can all hear that guy who's just waiting to well actually you. Um, that's not the point of a well actually. It's not to help you understand something better. Um, something like it's easy is sometimes counterintuitive because we think we're being encouraging by saying, it's so easy, even my grandma could do it, right? But you're, you might also be implying that the person really shouldn't need your help with it because it's so easy. Um, just X, Y, Z is directive. You're telling somebody exactly what to do in a specific situation, which might help them in that situation, but it doesn't give them anything transferable to take to another situation. And I've probably been um, guilty of all of these at some point. So don't feel bad if these are things um, that you do, because sometimes it's counterintuitive, really. So just be thinking about um, what you might be inadvertently communicating. Some good responses might be something like, what have you considered already? Or what went as planned? These are non-directive questions that are going to help somebody through their planning process so that they can th think about um, what the best decisions are or what's the best way to implement this in the future, or reiterate. Um, so these are examples of non-directive questions that are going to help somebody. Also, these questions jumpstart ideas and discussions. So they're going to do wonders in terms of validating their input as um, valuable. What do you need to feel supported? Um, sometimes we already know what the right answer is for ourselves, what the best solution is for ourselves. What we're looking for is either some validation or we're looking to know that if we fuck up, we're still going to be supported afterwards, right? Um, this is the antidote when X do Y because Z. This is the antidote to a directive just X, Y, Z. Um, so basically when uh, X occurs, my advice would be to do Y because of these reasons. That gives them something transferable as far as a thought process that they can take into another situation. Let's also mentor better and think of some ways that we can go above and beyond. Um, treat them as your colleague first and your mentor second. Um, a know-it-all approach is just going to be less effective when it comes to mentoring, so make sure that you're putting the relationship first. Also, self-care is going to be huge. There's no shame in taking the time to yourself when you need to recharge. Um, you can't pour from an empty cup. So just make sure that you're communicating clearly when you are available, when you're not available, when you're going to be gone for a week because you need to recharge, whatever it is. Um, know your limits and set and maintain your boundaries. Um, this is something that's hard, right? How many of us have been in a situation where we feel like we've taken on way too much and we're like, why did we do this, right? Um, it's, this is something that you learn over time as well. So just learn from those moments. Um, maybe try to anticipate those moments. Like if you know you're going to be exhausted after a full day conference, maybe a mentoring session the next day or a big project milestone the next day is not the best option. Um, but don't beat yourself up. Just try to learn um, and reiterate in the future. Uh, emotional intelligence, this is something that we could spend an entire weekend talking about. Um, but real quick, emotional intelligence is really made of three things. It's going to be your capacity for empathy, your personal competence, so that's going to be your self-awareness and your ability to self-manage, which self-care is going to be part of that self-managing. Um, your social competence, so it's going to be your social awareness and your ability to manage relationships. Make sure that you're thinking about these things and you're working on these things. Um, this is going to help you know 
uh, what emotional state somebody is in so that you know maybe when it's time to give them an extra push or maybe when it's time to suggest they take a break, right? So it's also gonna let you know when it's a mentoring moment, when it's a teachable moment, and when it's time to be supportive. Um, so what do we think are, like if you're mentoring somebody, what's a good way to know whether you should um, use that as a mentoring moment or whether you should maybe back off a little bit? Do we have any ideas? Avoiding eye contact, definitely. When it's something that's in their comfort zone, it's easier to use that as a teach. But when they're extended past what they do know they might be familiar with, and they're dealing with really unfamiliar stuff, it's usually better to teach it quicker. True. Yeah. Gauging their comfortable their comfort level when it comes to um, a specific topic for sure that's going to be helpful. Anybody else? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a good one, for sure. Yeah. How many times do we blame ourselves for procrastinating or missing goals when maybe what we need to do is reassess where we're at emotionally, how much we've taken on, right? Cool. Um, yeah, a lot of it's going to be body language, too, what we talked about before. Um, defensive body language, avoiding eye contact, again, reaching for the doorknob, right? Being distracted or impatient. Um, having really showing a lot of frustration on their face or through the words, even their word choice. Um, so pay attention to those things. Um, also, though, you don't necessarily need to always guess. You can ask, right? So something like, hey, you seem really frustrated. Do you think right now is a good time to take a break? Or, um, hey, how are you feeling? Um, is it, do you feel like you could take on a little bit more right now? So don't feel like you always have to guess at somebody's emotional state. You can ask them. Um, pay attention to cultural and personal sensitivities, too. Um, again, a lot of this is going to be body language. The person might come from a different background, socioeconomic background, a different country. Maybe English isn't their first language. Um, these are all going to um, maybe change the way that they communicate things and even non-verbally communicate things. Um, so keep a lookout for your own blind spots when it comes to this, because you have your own limited experience. Um, I had a, a fellow mentor and friend who I realized after a while that every time I had a conversation with her, we would start on one side of the room and we would end at the other side of the room. And I was so confused when I realized this. Can anybody guess why this was happening? Because I had no... I had no clue and I was so confused when I realized this, right? I have a much more malleable personal bubble. Like I'm an indiscriminate food sharer and double dipper, okay? <laughs> and this woman just had a really strict personal bubble. So like I would take a step forward and she would take a step back. And I was literally chasing this woman around the room, right? <laughs> so th these are things that are gonna be in your blind spots that you need to be watching out for. Um, Make sure you're acknowledging your differences and perspectives and you're appreciating them. Um, they've had different experiences and they're gonna continue to have different experiences than you. Um, even sometimes with the same exact actions, they're gonna have different outcomes. Make sure as well that you're working to outlive the relationship. So focus on their character development rather than their competency. Um, build them up so that they can make good decisions without you uh, because your goal is for them to rely on you less and less over time. And treat them as your forever mentor, like you're going to be their forever mentor. Um, that'll help you keep a long-term mindset so that you can give them long-term guidance that's going to outlive their time with you. And always, uh, this one is sometimes a hard one, let them make their own decisions. Um, you might be trying some, to save somebody from the same pain that you've been through, and you're watching them do exactly what you told them not to. Um, sometimes you just have to put your hand in the fire to know how hot it is, right? So um, make sure that they know that they're going to be supported regardless. You're there to support them. You're not there to tell them what to do. Um, so your goal is to protect them from the greatest risk mistakes, but ultimately, Completely ignoring and not following your, your advice is also an option. And always ask for feedback. 
Um, again, mentoring is a skill. So make sure that you're asking for the feedback that you need in order to be able to reiterate and improve based on that feedback. Uh, really, we all benefit from uh, more mentoring in our communities. Ultimately, it's about building healthy communities that can run on social capital and can thrive on collective growth. So mentoring helps develop a trust for candor and openness in our communities um, that are going to create the space for greater successes and greater connections. Um, so for me, mentoring has been huge. It helped me transition careers into development. Um, it helped me find a super supportive community um, where I was really lacking one uh, before. It's not only helped me in my career, though. It's also helped me make better decisions for myself in my personal life. Um, and it's helped me grow immensely. Not just mentoring, but also um, having mentors, um, being within a, a community of fellow mentors, that's all had a huge impact on me. So I hope that um, you guys will all take the time to sort of try to find a mentoring opportunity in your communities. Um, if you don't know of one or don't know where to find one, uh, please hit me up and let's see if we can figure it out together. Thank you. Do we have questions? Um, how many of you guys have been in a mentoring, have been a mentor to somebody? Okay. How many of you guys have um, had a mentor? Cool. Um, what, are, what are some hesitations for the folks who haven't participated in a mentoring relationship? Is it just something not on your radar, or is it something that you literally have thought about but have shied away from for some reason? Okay. Well, um, yeah, definitely think about it, guys. Please uh, hit me up with questions if you have any questions uh, going forward, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Okay.